Om Namah Shivaya 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 Om Namaste Still having a blast with music and computer graphics and all kinds of toys here. But really, what is it about? What is spiritual life really about? It's about ending suffering. It's about tasting the real enjoyment of life, which has nothing to do with physical pleasures. Although it can be expressed through music and art and dancing and things like that. But the real purpose of all of this is to be relieved from the suffering of material existence. Now, if you have any sensitivity, any real perception at all, you will be aware that we're suffering, that you're suffering, I'm not suffering. <laughs> but anyone who is caught in material conditioning and who is a little bit intelligent is suffering. There's a shloka, I forget where I read it, that there are only two kinds of people who are not suffering in this world. The complete idiots <laughs> and the self-realized. Everyone in between is suffering. Why? Because they can perceive this tension between the ideal and the real, between the life they want to live and the life they have to live, between the ideal society and the society that we've got. Isn't it? So this is a source of suffering, this tension. And when this tension resolves and one sees that, oh, actually, this world is set up perfectly. And my life has also been set up perfectly to drive me towards self-realization. And when one actually attains self-realization, well, that's the end of suffering. Even though the material body is still being driven by the prarabdha karma, we've discussed this so many times, even a jivan mukta, even a liberated soul, still has to experience the karma that is slated for fruition in this life. The difference is that because the karma only refers to the body and mind, once you realize that you're different from the body and the mind, you don't suffer. And everyone gets a certain quota of enjoyment in life. You know, it's not totally suffering. It's not totally dry or boring. There can be some really nice moments. So well, let's look at the next shloka, because that talks about the condition, the status, and the mood of the enlightened being. Nistutir nirnam akaro nisvada kara eva cha chala chala niketash cha yatir yadrichiko bhavet. The man of self restraint should be above all praise, salutation and all rites prescribed by the Smriti in connection with departed ancestors. He should have this body and the Atman as his support and depend upon chance. That is, for his physical wants, he should be satisfied with those things that chance brings to him. Very interesting shloka, because it deals with the mode of life of the Jivan Mukta, the realized soul. Now, 
The thing about this is that, of course, one shloka cannot cover all the details of the realized life. So it's just giving a broad indication. And even that is within the context of a society that existed thousands of years ago and doesn't really exist anymore. In those days, no one went hungry. There was no charge for food. Food was always given. It was never bought and sold. That's a modern invention, only 100 or 200 years old. In fact, there are people still alive in India today who have made extensive pilgrimages all over India without carrying a bit of money with them, and they never starved. So this modern society has really put everyone in a prison made of money. You can't eat, you can't rent a house, you can't live anywhere, you can't do anything without money. And of course, that means the people who control the money control the whole society. And because the people who control the money are greedy rascals, everyone is suffering. We have so much less freedom than people did 100 or 200 years ago, what to speak of 1,000 or 2,000 years ago, when these verses were written. So try to understand and map what is being said here to how it would work out or, or how it would be implemented in today's society. In any case, the man of self-restraint, the realized person, restrains himself. He is not bound by laws and principles and rules, even of the scripture, but he sees because he knows the self, how the actions produce consequences in the future. His vision is not limited to the present. His moment of attention is much bigger than the average person. So he can see clearly the consequences of any action done in a moment now. Therefore, he restrains himself from doing things that result in suffering. See? So he's above all praise, both giving and receiving praise. He has no need for praise because he's in touch with God. He is one with Shiva. He, is, he knows his identity as Brahman. And nothing could ever convince him otherwise because it's a settled conclusion. It's a fixed realization. Once having seen, one can never unsee one's identity with Brahman. And then uh, he's also above salutation. He doesn't need to be recognized. He doesn't need to be honored or praised nor does he recognize or praise others as being authorities over him. He's free. Because what can they do to him? See, the power of authorities comes from the punishment that they can give. And for one who is self-realized, there's no punishment. What can they punish? Only the body or the mind. And those are going away anyway. See? Oh, there's a wonderful story in the Buddha Suttas about a group of travelers, and amongst them was one monk. And as they were going through the forest, they were attacked by robbers. And the robbers took everything from them and kept them captive, hostage in the forest. And at one point they announced, okay, Soon we're going to kill everybody. We don't want to take any prisoners. And we don't want anybody else to know what happened. So, of course, everybody was lamenting and frightened, all except the monk. 
The monk was like, oh, really? You're going to kill us? When? <laughs> How? <laughs> he wanted to talk about it. He was interested. And the robbers are like, what kind of weirdo is this? <laughs> but the chief of the robbers was an intelligent man. So he started to question the monk. He started to discuss with him. Well, you know, if anybody else comes along this trail and there's anyone left to tell them there's robbers, etc., etc. You know, he explained the whole thing. And the monk said, oh, that's very interesting. And the robber said, well, aren't you afraid? The monk said, afraid of what? I'm already going to die. I mean, the body is already going to die. And I know that I'm not the body. So it's just like another thing that happens. Not to be afraid of. It's going to be interesting. So in the same way, the self-realized person is not afraid of anything or anybody. He's not afraid to do the right thing all the time. And of course, the right thing is to stay on this platform of self-realization. And one of the things that he does is that he does not necessarily have to perform the scriptural rites. Of course, people are so atheistic today that they don't perform them anyway. But it's not because they're self-realized. It's because they're ignorant, faithless rascals. They're atheists. A person who is self-realized is neither an, a, a theist nor an atheist. He is simply Brahman. He is what he is. And he doesn't need any God because he doesn't believe in the world. As soon as you see the world, you need God to explain the appearance of the world. Who created it? Who designed it? Who runs it? Who's in charge here? So then, he should have this body and the Atman. Chala chala niketash. Huh? The moving and the non-moving. The body and Brahman. He doesn't need any other support. And like I said, he knows the body is going away. So he's not too concerned about that. His main support is Brahman. Because that never changes. Achala. Like Arunachala. Huh? So this is the explanation of the behavior of the self-realized one who says, he just depends upon chance. Chance here doesn't mean random uh, probability. Chance means fate, or as we were discussing earlier, prarabdha karma. He depends upon his prarabdha karma, that as long as the karma is there for the continuation of this body, food is coming, shelter and other needs are coming. One does not have to endeavor for survival or for improvement in the status of life or anything like that. Now, of course, if there's some problem in life, you can apply the tools in the scriptures to solve them. If there's some problem with the body or mind, perform karma yoga, solve the problem. If there's some problem with the heart, perform bhakti, devotion, and solve the problem. If there's some problem with consciousness, perform meditation and solve the problem. Raja Yoga. And of course, once attainment of Jnana is there, you don't need to perform Jnana Yoga anymore or any other scripturally mandated rites. Unless, you know, there's some issue that you want to solve and use them as tools. So for the self-realized being, life becomes very simple. There's no place to go, nothing to, not that one needs, you know. Uh, there's no demands, no desires, no anxieties, no assets either. Therefore, no fears of loss. 
And there is no uh, need for further self-realization because Brahman is absolute. And once one realizes one's identity with Brahman, that's it. So there's no need for sadhana, although you can do sadhana if you have a specific issue that you need to address. This is the life of the self-realized being. And this is actually the peak of enlightenment, the perfection of self-realization. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.